space saving versions of A star and today we want to first look at pruning the closed list. Okay. So, just to recap, assuming that you are working with a heuristic function which satisfies the monotone criteria or the consistency criteria, we are worried about two things. One is that as the community now calls it, uh, stop the search from leaking back. Which means basically, just imagine the search frontier being pushed out into the search space. The open node should not come back from inside the search space, whatever what would have been in the closed list essentially. That is the first objective and the second objective would be of course, to reconstruct the path. So, let us first worry about the first objective is that how can you stop the search from going backwards. Uh, so, in 2000 or so, uh, Korf, our old friend who has been working on this for a while and his student Zhang, they devised this algorithm which I will name in a little while, but it works as follows that imagine that you have this node x and you generate its children and let us only look at the forward children. So, let us say th this. So, let us say we are expanding the search frontier here and let us just call them A, B, C essentially. Now, what Korf and Zhang suggested was that you store along with these nodes. So, this is open, this is going to be the new open. So, with every node in open, you store its parents, list of its parents. So, with A for example, we will store x here, with B also we will store x, with C also we will store x. What is the idea? The idea is that this list forms a kind of a taboo list essentially, which means that when we in turn were to pick A or B or C for expansion, we would not generate those children which we have listed in this list here. So, it is a very simple mechanism for search to be pushed only in the forward direction essentially. Now, for example, if there was a y here which was related to x and let us say this y was also connected to this c and b essentially. So, at the point when y was expanded, then this x this could become x comma y this also would become x comma y. So, with every node in open, we maintain a list of nodes which will not be generated when that node is, when the move gen is called with that node essentially. So, it is like a taboo list with every node essentially. So, with this simple mechanism, you can see it has the effect, if you think about this, that every edge is traversed only once while searching. So, this edge from x to a is only traversed in this direction or in other words a back pointer is put only in this direction. A, x can never become a child of a, x can never become a child of b, x can never become a child of c and so on. And when a is generated, some new nodes may be generated, maybe even b may be generated. But x would not be generated. So, the children of A are going to be these nodes. So, this is one mechanism for stopping the search from leaking back, which means that, so let us say the source is somewhere here and the search frontier is expanding. So, when we, when we generate children of A, it will only be the forward looking children 
after a if we generate b then a will not be generated but some other children of b will be generated and the search will only push in the forward direction so one task of getting into loops is taken care of by modifying the nodes in open list by augmenting them with extra information as to which nodes should not be generated a little bit later some 3 or 4 years later another chinese student zhao working with his us supervisor uh, produced a different algorithm uh, in which they had a slightly different mechanism for search from leaking back and their mechanism was as follows that the set closed is partitioned into two sets uh, one is called the kernel and the other is called the boundary and the way to distinguish between the kernel and the boundary is that this has no children on open and this is the negation of this which means at least one child this is remember this is a closed list essentially so if i were to draw the closed list if i if, if this is a start node uh, then everything inside this is on the closed list and everything on this frontier is open so the boundary nodes which i if i can draw in this color would be those nodes which are which have at least one child in open and all other nodes so let me draw them as a rhombus which had children which are all on closed would be the kernel essentially so they distinguish between closed and open and the idea here is that when you generate children of open you only need to look at the boundary and boundary serves the old function of closed which was to avoid the search from looping essentially so if a child is present in the boundary then you don't generate it uh, otherwise you generate it it has the same function of pushing the search in the forward direction so this boundary layer this intermediate layer of nodes the boundary layer and it basically stops the search from coming back so any node will not generate a child in boundary in the boundary list okay so now let's address the second function of closed which is to reconstruct the path because it 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 allows us to reconstruct the path from the start to the goal node how do we how do korf and zhang handle this so i hope this is clear this mechanism for pushing the search only in the forward direction and taking care of the first part that there is no looping which is going to take place is taken care in in this case by modifying the open list to allow only successors which are not in the closed and in this case by actually storing a pruned closed list we will see that this kernel is not necessarily stored but the boundary has to be stored and the boundary is going to be only the edge of the closed essentially in some sense and so if you only store those then you can stop the search from coming back essentially so let's look at the other problem of how to reconstruct the path so korf and zhang's algorithm actually it maintains only the open list it does not maintain the closed list at all essentially so the algorithm the the search space that this algorithm generates is something like this so i have this start list and i have this open list and i have the goal here yeah? and that's all i have i have only nodes on the open 
observe that these nodes are modified they store information about what nodes I do not want to generate. So, basically it has some extra information for every node there will be a list of few nodes uh, which are taboo for it, it to be generated as children. Now, instead of closed what they maintain is a layer of nodes another layer of nodes which is roughly like this and this is called uh, the relay layer. And the relay layer is a list of nodes. So, let me draw the relay with this rhombus this time and we will keep it for the relay nodes only. And every node on the open. So, remember that in A star we maintain the parent pointer that every node had a parent which we would reassign if necessary if we found a better path and all that kind of stuff. Now, we are saying we will never find a better path anyway. So, we do not need to worry about that, but we still and the function that the parent pointer did for us was to allow us to reconstruct the path when we found the goal node essentially. Now, in this algorithm by Zhang and Korf every node on open maintains a pointer to an ancestor which is in the relay layer. So, every node will have one ancestor in the relay layer and so on essentially. So, of course, it is not pruning the closed completely, it is replacing closed by a another layer essentially which is the relay layer essentially, but it has pruned everything else essentially. Now, what it tries to do is that the relay layer is roughly at the halfway mark. So, I just write halfway mark here. So, I am not writing the details here, we will give you pointers to the papers uh, as well as you can refer to my book and I have described the algorithm there. Initially, when the search starts, it you do not maintain any pointers, or you can say figuratively that you maintain a pointer to the source node essentially, an ancestor pointer, which you do not really have to. But at some point, it decides that a given node is at the halfway mark from the start to the goal essentially, and it says, I will make this node a relay layer. So, the first question is relay node. The first question is how do you de decide that a node is at the halfway mark? It does not have to be exact, but roughly at the halfway mark. You look at its values, what would happen at the halfway mark at the f value? g and h should be roughly equal essentially. So, I will say g of n is roughly equal to h of n. If your heuristic function is good, then it will be closer to being equal. If the heuristic function is very conservative, then it will end up setting up a real layer a little bit earlier than actually it is required. So, maybe you can have a factor or something, but let us not get into those details essentially. So, this is how the algorithm works, it maintains one boundary, it sorry it maintains one search frontier uh, or the open list and after a certain point in the search, it maintains a, lay, a relay layer essentially. Initially you can imagine when the open is here, there is no need for relay, only when it has pushed beyond roughly the halfway mark which is here it starts constructing a relay layer and then it pushes forward essentially. So, that is a basic search algorithm no closed, but this thing. So, you can imagine that when a child when, when this node is expanded into these two nodes, then this will be deleted 
this node will be deleted and the parent pointer would be pointed to this essentially. So, it will it will pass on the pointer to the its children and so on. So, at some point do the goal is picked essentially at some point the goal is picked and the goal will have some pointer to some relay node here. So, when you pick the goal you know what is the cost of reaching that goal and the optimal cost of reaching the goal because you know its g value because we are we have shown that A star finds an optimal path. So, when you pick the goal node you have you know the cost of the optimal path to the goal, but you do not know the path all you know is that there is one relay node let us call it R which is an ancestor of the goal node on the path it is on the path and it is an ancestor of the goal node. Now, how what do you do? You want the whole path you want all the nodes which take you from the start node to the goal node essentially and all you have is one it is like somebody tells you that if you are going from here to Delhi then Bhopal is a relay node or something like that I do not know the distances, but let us see that that you have to go to you have to first go to Bhopal then you go to Delhi and you will get the optimal path. So, let us first reveal the name of this algorithm it is called D C F S and the expansion is divide and conquer frontier search. So, this should give you a clue as to how do you reconstruct the path. So, to reconstruct the path you make two recursive calls to divide and conquer frontier search essentially. Hmm? One call goes from S to R and the second call goes from R to G. You make two recursive calls and what would that give you? That would give you two more nodes somewhere here and somewhere here then you make four recursive calls from here to here and here to here and so on and you keep doing that till the problem has just become an edge that the next node is just the child of the first node essentially that is a base clause when you terminate recursion essentially. So, remember that once you have solved the first once you have made the first call to divide and conquer frontier search you have finished with all your memory requirements and all you know is that there is this start node there is this relay node and there is this goal node and then you are making a fresh call which is a to a smaller problem roughly of half the size provided this is this holds that g is roughly equal to h. Otherwise, there may be an unequal number of size, which means as you can imagine, it is like working with a unbalanced binary search tree rather than a balanced binary search tree. You may do more work in one half and less in the other half, but as long as you can divide it roughly half, you will split the work half and half and you will keep doing that till you have eventually reconstructed the path, the full path. So, that is why this name divide and conquer frontier search. So, the space requirements of this algorithm is only to maintain the open list of the frontier and a relay layer essentially and that is all it needs to do essentially. So, we have thrown away most of the closed list and in the kind of problems that we discussed uh, the sequence alignment problems it is closed which is growing faster than, than, than open essentially. Open is only growing linearly closed was growing as a quadratic of the size of the problem. What would be the complexity of this? So, 
So, you can say that if the original problem of depth d could be size solved with time complexity d, whatever d is, it depends on the heuristic function really, but it is some exponential function in general plus the extra work that you are doing. What is the extra work? 2 into t of d by 2 plus 4 into t of d by 4, so of depth 4, depth d by 4 and, and so on and so forth till you solve the small problem of depth 1 essentially. So, some, some value x into t of depth 1. So, all that is the extra work you are doing and all the extra work is done to reconstruct the path actually. How much is the extra work? So, you can solve this. It is you multiply by log to the base 2 of the depth of the complexity of T d multiply take the log of that. So, if T d were to be exponential in nature b raised to d then this would be d times x log. So, you are doing if you are finding a path of length d then essentially you are doing d times extra work. So, if the path is of length 50 then you are doing 50 times extra work to reconstruct the path, but in the process you are saving on space essentially. Let us see what Zhao and Hansen do. What they say is why do we break up the problem into half, what is the rationale for breaking up the problem into half. Of course, we know that the divide and conquer strategy says that if you break it up into half then you can you know solve it using this complexity, but in this era of increasing memory available they say that you should do this pruning of closed only if you are running out of memory essentially. So, their algorithm is called SMGS and it expands to smart memory graph search. So, what do Zhao and Hansen do? They say you just run it like A star, do not worry about pruning or something, but you keep track of how, many, how much memory your algorithm is using somehow. And if you can at some point realize that you are running out of memory, then you prune essentially. And what do you prune? You prune the kernel. You keep the boundary because you need it. And in fact, when you prune the kernel at that same very time, you convert this into a relay. So, initially this algorithm is working with this layer boundary layer and the open layer going neck to neck. The open layer is moving forward, the boundary layer is just following it. At some point, so let us say this is the situation, this is the boundary layer, this is the open layer. So, the outside one is the boundary layer, the inner one is the sorry the outside one is the open layer and the inner one is the boundary layer and whatever is inside the boundary layer is closed uh, or the kernel. And so, your counter or something tells you that you are running out of memory. So, what do you do? You prune the entire closed and convert this into a relay layer. And search progresses from there as before. So, let us say it is gone here and it is got another boundary layer following it essentially. So, at, at all points a boundary layer just follows this search frontier 
because it needs to keep the search from leaking back essentially. Every time you generate children of open, you check on the boundary layer if there are children or not and then. Then this is the area between this curve and this curve is the kernel which you have not pruned essentially. Then again you have some, somebody tells you you are running out of memory. So again you convert this into another layer. So that is why it is called smart memory in the sense it is aware of how much memory it is using and whether it is running out of memory essentially. So unlike divide and conquer frontier search which maintains one relay layer roughly along the halfway mark, the smart memory graph search maintains as many layers as are required. It could be 0, it could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 4 depending on how big the problem is and how much memory is available to you and at some point when it finds the goal, it would have some path up to some relay layer which they call as a dense path. And from this layer to another layer by a mechanism that you can work out, it would have a series of ancestor pointers which they call as a sparse path. So in their terminology, divide and conquer frontier search has two sparse paths, one from start to relay and one from relay to goal. In smart memory graph search, if you are solving a very large problem, you may have a bigger sparse path and then of course you would have to make that many recursive calls to solve each of them. So it may be the case that the first time around you make 5 relay layers. So from start to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4 and 4 to 5. So you will make 5 recursive calls but for each of the recursive calls it is possible because it is a smart algorithm you may not do many more recursive calls because you can imagine that it is close to what it, this memory can tolerate essentially. So it is a little bit different from this in that sense that it is aware of how much memory it can use and only prunes kernel when it is running out of memory. And remember that pruning kernel incurs this cost of reconstructing the path because once you have thrown away all these nodes you have to do all these recursive calls to reconstruct this path, you have to do recursive calls to reconstruct this path. But here you have not thrown away, so you just have to follow the back pointers and you can just get the path from there. So depending on how much memory is available, this behaves in a more smart way essentially. Okay, now, so let us move on to now pruning the closed list essentially, uh, which is uh, the work in fact carried by these two groups all over again. So how does one prune the closed list? And what? Zhao and Hansen showed and this was around 2004, so it is not so back in time compared to the algorithms that we are looking at. They gave us an algorithm which is called, uh, sounds like a curious name but you can see what they are doing, breadth first heuristic search. It's, it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but so the basic idea behind breadth first series works, and now we are talking about pruning open. Now, most algorithms which prune the open list rely on getting some upper bound on the cost essentially. So compute u the upper bound. On f. 
of the problem that you are trying to solve. What is the maximum possible value that the cost of sol the solution can be essentially? How do you compute an upper bound? One way is to use some greedy algorithm to try to find a solution. So, you do some beam search with very thick beam width and hopefully you will get some solution. It may not be optimal, but it will give you an upper bound essentially. So, if you know one solution, that solution can be made the upper bound and that is a theme which runs into many variations of these algorithms that we are going to see. Is that as and when you find better solutions, you reduce the upper bound essentially. And then what they say is the following that if this is your start goal and this is a goal node and if you have a boundary which is the upper bound, well that is not quite correct. So, the upper bound serves as a boundary which means that any node with f value greater than this value u, you will not expand. So, if you generate a child here for example, then you will never expand these two children. So, that is the purpose that this boundary is serving. So, you are only going to search within this hypothetical boundary which is determined by the f, f value essentially. So, before expanding a node from open, check whether it's, it is less than u only then you expand this essentially. Now, if you were to do A star like search, then the open at some point would look like this, hmm? that node that you would so this thing. Whereas, if you do breadth first search, keeping this upper bound in mind. Now, if you were to do blind breadth first search, your search boundary would look like this. Assuming that you know the costs are roughly equal for every edge essentially, just to visualize the problem. But if you are doing this breadth first heuristic search, which means you are guided by this upper bound which you have generated by some heuristic algorithm, then your open is only going to be this much. So, this is the open. for this algorithm is yes. and basically empirically one can observe that the size of open for this breadth first heuristic search is smaller than the size of open for A star which is roughly like this. So, this should give you a visual intuition, but this is do not take it at face value, but it just to, to allow you to give you an intuition essentially. Now, another variation to this is to prune this even further, which is to keep it of constant width and you can imagine the algorithm is beam search. So, beam search and we have explored beam search earlier. This is a variation of beam search in the sense that uh, you keep searching till you find the goal rather than hill climbing like beam search where you stop if you do not find a better node. Here the meaning of beam search is that you maintain an open list of constant width and then you search towards the goal. Now, obviously it is not complete. because you are throwing away other nodes. See breadth first heuristic search is complete, it will find a path to the goal, but beam search may just go off in this direction away from the goal and may never actually give you a path. So, it is not complete. So, how can we make beam search complete? Okay, before we do that, Zhao and Anson also gave us, so this is a, uh, breadth first heuristic search and you can convert this into divide and conquer breadth first 
heuristic search by using a divide and conquer mechanism of which we are by now familiar which means that along with so in general if you were to draw this graph you would have an open which is progressing like this followed by a closed not closed a boundary layer which is just behind it so you can imagine the search you know prog progressing in this direction and this open will slowly get converted into a boundary and the new open will move forward and also one layer somewhere in between so this is a relay this is a boundary and this is open so if you maintain these three layers of nodes you can convert breadth first heuristic search into divide and conquer breadth first heuristic search and you will have to do the same mechanism of reconstructing the path on the way in that kind of stuff so is an algorithm which not only saves on open it also saves on closed uh, because you are no, no longer keeping the close you are only keeping the boundary and the real layer essentially exactly like what smart memory graph search would have done okay. now you can of course do the same thing with beam search that you can maintain a you can cut off this whole thing here and you can keep only what is in this area so this is your open this is your boundary this is your real layer and you will have divide and conquer beam search essentially which of course also would not be complete so again han zhao zhao was a phd student hansen was a supervisor give us an algorithm which is called beam stack search so we will visualize this algorithm as a search tree because it is easier to do it like that so just imagine that this is a search tree that that same search algorithm generates and we saw this mapping earlier we assume that this search tree is ordered so that the lowest heuristic values are on the left and the right and the highest at each layer is ordered so that this is increasing h just for the sake of visualization we assume that this t is ordered by increasing h values in which case the boundary that we are talking about there given by the u upper bound on this thing would look something like this so you have to think a little bit about this and convince yourself that this is how my u value leaf remember that this side is values lesser than u and that side is values greater than u and because u is an upper bound on the cost that we have somehow figured out we know that we don't have to search that part of the tree so we have to only search this part of the tree essentially and because it's a heuristic search we can now assume that since we are assuming that in this visualization the tree is drawn in such a way that heuristic values are increasing from left to right so you can imagine the heuristic search will also progress from left to right essentially so the divide the beam stack search is essentially a beam search in this space first of all it's a beam search 
and the beam of course starts searching from the leftmost but I have drawn it in the middle just to show what happened. Now beam search is incomplete we have observed essentially. So you can make it complete by introducing backtracking that a little bit like what recursive best first search would have done. No, we, we are not talking about the backed up values just backtracking and, and retrying. So if, if it runs into this upper bound it backtracks and tries something backtracks and tries something. So something like backtracking behavior we want to simulate except that keep in mind that in this visualization which is actually my own idea you would not find it in their paper uh, this heuristic values are ordered from left to right. So it is like a on this space it is like doing that first search from left to right. But how do we do this backtracking and, and how do we in practice implement that we do it by maintaining another data structure called the beam stack where at each layer we store two values one is f min and the other is f max and it it is a open interval on the right hand side and close interval on the left hand side. So this two values are telling us as to where in this space you are searching. So the value of f min is here and the value of f max is here. So it tells the algorithm which part of the search space you are searching essentially and this it does for every layer. For every layer we have uh, f min these two values. this is open. So what does that mean that if you are backtracking and you are coming back to this point in this layer you have not found a solution and you have come back to this layer you want to start a second search here then essentially this was the value f min at this level and f max at this level you go back to this layer and reset this value. So let us say this is uh, 100 and this is 150 let us say in some domain you replace it with 150 and some other value whatever because you have the open list you, you generate the open list and so you go back to its parent here generate the open list take children only whose values are greater than or equal to this 150 or f max essentially and construct a new beam layer essentially. So depending on something it could be something like 180 or something like that. What is the initial value for this beam stack every value will have 0 comma u. So what this beam stack is doing is it is helping with the backtracking process. Once you backtrack to a layer and you generate so you go to these nodes and generate their children again so call move gen again which of those children do you want to now explore next this beam stack will tell you that you have already seen values up to 150 and look at values which are greater than 150 essentially f values. So generate only look at those values so depending on of course how many there are this value could be 180 or it could be 190 or, or whatever essentially. So, so you must convince yourself that maintaining this beam stack allows us to search completely in the search space. So of course you could it is very difficult to visualize in this space here but uh, in this space which is an ordered h values it is easy to visualize that the search will progress from left to right and you if you can search this entire space inside this u then your algorithm is going to be complete essentially and this beam stack allows us to do that essentially. So this is called BSS beam stack search and the next step as you can imagine is 
divide and conquer beam stack search. You can expand this. We have got used to this idea of DC BSS first. What does this do? This maintains only four layers, like those divide and conquer breadth first heuristic search. It maintains one open layer, one boundary layer, sorry, one boundary layer here, and some relay layer in between. It maintains only these three things. Beam stack search maintains all this, everything which is inside this beam basically. So the question I want to ask, which I hope has occurred to you, is in beam stack search, you had the parents of every node. So you could go back to the parent and regenerate the parents children and take the next set of children. In B, divide and conquer beam stack search, you do not have. You only have the open layer, you only have the boundary layer and you only have the relay layer. How can you backtrack now? I hope you see the problem essentially. Maybe I am going a bit fast here, that is probably that is because I am running out of time. How can, how can this search go here and retry this way? Let's let's say the the relay doesn't matter. Let's say this was a relay or something. It doesn't matter. How can it go here and how can it do this step? Because we don't have the parent of this relay node here. And and more, what is more, we don't have the parent of this boundary node, so we can't go back to its parent and then its parent. And this. So this was a paper published by Zhao and Hansen in ICAPS 2005, ICAPS is International Con Conference on Auto Automated Planning and Scheduling and for this paper they got the best paper award in that conference essentially. So it is possible. So let me ask you, I want to do, I want to simulate the behavior of beam stack search which means I will go down searching down the beam and if I have hit the boundary, I will come back and try something else, I will come back and try something else. The trouble is, if I have thrown away the closed list or the parents, how can I come back and try something else? We have one minute to answer this question. The answer is that you do not talk of going back, you regenerate from the source again. And so supposing you are at the ninth layer and you want to backtrack to the eighth layer, what do you do? You go to the start and generate eight layers. Which children should you pick? The beam stack will tell you that of all the children that you are generating, which ones are the ones which are inside this beam, that beam stack has this information. So you go up to the eighth layer and then you can generate each and every ninth layer. Of course, that is extra work again. <coughs> Backtracking one step would have been just for going to the parent and then retrying, but here you have to come from the source all, all the way to the parent and then from this parent to the next parent, again you have to go all the way and so on. So if you have to backtrack, you have this extra work. But as a result of this, if you do not count the memory required by the beam stack which grows linearly with depth but these are small values let us hope. What is the space complexity of divide and conquer beam stack search? It is constant. You are just keeping three layers of constant width, the open layer, the boundary layer and the relay layer. So here starting with an algorithm A star which required exponential amount of space, we have an algorithm which practically requires constant amount of space. And in this era of huge memory sizes, you can keep the beam width as large as you can and it will work. So I will stop here. I believe Professor Sri Chaudhary is waiting outside or he should be waiting outside. Uh, uh, and with this, we will end the search part of it. We will look at problem solving from a slightly different perspective in the next class that we meet on Wednesday, which is you know looking from the goal towards the problem essentially. How can you move from goal to the problem description? <laughs>